Hey everybody, welcome to another OCHEM video. We're gonna be covering today part one of OCHEM reactions. So organic, organic chemistry reactions are going to tie a lot of the things that we've talked about together, especially particularly in the OCHEM fundamental toolkit videos. Um, there's gonna be three parts to the OCHEM reaction lecture series. Um, part one is gonna to be today, which is going to, well, if you're watching this on YouTube, it's always today. Part one is gonna be um, substitution and elimination reactions. Part two is going to be addition reactions. So things like Grignard, things like aldol condensation, um, things like hydrides. And we'll cover some, some other things such as like oxidation and reduction in organic chemistry. And then part three is gonna be carboxylic acid derivatives and their reactions. So without further ado, let's get started with our substitution and elimination. So in substitution reactions, we have two classes of reaction. Of course, we have SN1 and SN2. And does anybody remember, how do we define the one and the two in substitution? What does the one mean? What does the two mean? property of reactions do they respond to? One being unimolecular, yes. Two being bimolecular. And so these one and this two, the unimolecular and the bimolecular are referring to reaction order. So two classes we have defined by order. So SN2, uh, one step versus two step. So there is a one step versus two step. And it's kind of confusing because it's the opposite of the number in the reaction order, as we'll see. So SN2 reactions will be fast. They will be one step. And they will be second order. SN1 reactions will be slow. They will be two or more steps. And they will be first order overall. So those are the differences between the, the major gross differences of between SN2 and SN1. The commonality is that both require a nucleophile attacking an electrophile and a leaving group leaving. Leaving group leaving. So far, any questions? All right, so I'm going to erase. Let's introduce these reactions with a couple of examples. All right, so in our first example here, we have, looks like an ethyl iodide with a molecule of CN minus. Anybody know the name of CN minus? Cyanide. And in CN minus, is the minus charge on the carbon or on the nitrogen? Both. 
So not in the best resonance structure. Well, I, uh, I think, I assume you're talking about resonance structures. So if we try to draw a Lewis structure for these guys, well, they have to have a complete octet and carbon likes to make normally four bonds. Nitrogen likes to make normally three bonds. So we can accomplish three of those bonds by just making a triple bond. It looks like we don't have a lot of other options for places to put our two bonds. And then we can fill everybody's octet. If we wanted to check, we could check to make sure that we have the proper number of electrons by saying, uh, what valence number is carbon? How many valence electrons does carbon have? Four. And nitrogen. Five. And then are we good or do we have to account for the minus charge? What do we do when there's a formal charge when we're trying to do electron accounting? For minuses, we will add the number of electrons that corresponds to the charge. So in this case, we're going to add one. And for pluses, we would, we would subtract a corresponding number of electrons to whatever the positive charge is. So we should have a total of 10 electrons in our structure. And we have two, four, six eight tens, we have the proper number of electrons. Now carbon um, versus nitrogen. So who's happy right now with the number of bonds and lone pairs they're making? Carbon or nitrogen is happy? Nitrogen's happy, right? We know nitrogen likes to make three bonds and one lone pair. Carbon likes to have how many like electrons close to it? Well, its valence is four, right? So it would prefer to have four electrons close to it, but how many does it have right now? Five, because we count our bonds, each has one electron, because we assume that they cut down right straight down the middle. So one, two, three, four, five. So carbon wants to have four electrons close, but it has five. So therefore it has an excess of one electron and we'll have a negative charge. So um, the reason why I bring up the structure is because A, um, we're usually used to seeing negative charges on electronegative atoms. And this is a case where the best structure uh, has the negative charge on carbon as opposed to the more electronegative nitrogen. So that's the first reason I always like to bring this up with people. And then second reason is uh, that it's very important who has a negative charge here because we're talking about a nucleophile. So the nucleophilic atom in cyanide, and this is a rare instance where carbon is acting as a nucleophile. There's going to be two main instances of this on the MCAT, which would be this molecule CN minus, and then as we'll talk about in our next video next week, enolates. So carbons are nucleophile. We know nucleophiles need to have either a partial negative or a full negative charge, and they need to have a free lone pair in order to make a bond. So um, is CN minus a strong or a weak nucleophile? Is CN minus a strong or a weak? It is a strong nucleophile. This is an excellent nucleophile because as we were just saying, carbon's not happy with a negative charge. It's not very electronegative. And so this will be a strong nucleophile. And in general, We'll usually just say if something has a full negative charge, that's a strong nucleophile. Um, as we'll see, there, we'll introduce a little bit of nuance later, but that'll be just our general rule. So we have a strong nucleophile. And what's the degree of substitution of our leaving group? What's the degree of substitution of our leaving groups, carbon? Primary, secondary, tertiary, primary. Yes. So we have a primary uh, carbon to leaving group. So will this be a SN2 or an SN1 reaction? Is this just gonna wanna go immediately or is it gonna want to wait for something to happen? 
SN2. Yeah, this guy wants to go right now because we have a strong nucleophile and we have a not sterically hindered leaving group and we have a perfectly good leaving group with iodine here. And so of course, this is what will happen. It'll all take place in one step. With iodide having been the leaving group, any questions on a very basic SN2 reaction? So now, what about over here? Do we have a strong or a weak nucleophile? What's the name of this molecule? Yeah, this is a weak dude. It's got no formal charge for starters. What's the name of that molecule, by the way? Carboxylic acid. And specifically with two carbons makes it a molecule of? Say ethanoic acid to be systematic, but the common name is acetic acid. Nice, yeah, acetic acid, perfect. So while we don't have a full negative charge, we do have a partial negative charge on our oxygen here. Because our oxygen is bonded to a hydrogen who it's more electronegative than and a carbon who's also more electronegative than. Do we have a, um, do we have a sterically hindered leaving group? And we have a very sterically hindered leaving group. So with our weak nucleophile, is it likely that it's gonna just be able to come in and just kick off the iodine immediately? Or do we have to wait? Bulky, right, right. Gotta wait. And what do we have to wait for? Well, if we can't use our nucleophile to kick the iodine off, we have to wait for the iodine to, yes, to leave on its own. And so that will be, of course, just one molecule reacting with itself with iodine to leave. And what's gonna be the charge of the carbon after iodine leaves? Be positive, we'll form a carbocation. Are those guys stable or unstable? Carbocations? Unstable. Now, is it also true that we do have the most stable possible carbocation? True, true. So we have, of course, always carbocations being highly unstable, but we do have the most stable carbocation you can get, which is tertiary. And so that's another thing that favors, as we'll see, SN1 reactions. When we have a more substituted leaving group, the carbocation that can be formed can be semi-stabilized, we could say. Is this step gonna happen quickly or is it gonna take a really long time? It's gonna take a long time. So this is gonna be our rate determining step for SN1 and as we'll see as well for E1. And now we have, is this a good or a poor electrophile? With our carbocation, do we have a good or a poor new, uh, electrophile? We have extremely good, yes. Because not only does this have a partial, so the full positive charge, and of course, if you have a full positive charge, you don't have enough electrons, you want more electrons. Not only that, does carbon here have a complete octet? Doesn't even have a complete octet. And do you know what's worse than having a formal charge? Having an incomplete octet. And you know what's even worse having both? So we have an exceptional electrophile with our carbocation, and it's so good that even this weak nucleophile over here can attack it. And so there's step number two.
and we could draw our I minus having left. Any formal charges in this molecule, for this intermediate molecule here? Any formal charges? O plus, excellent, yeah. Oxygen, not really stoked about having to make three bonds. Oxygen really prefers two, as we know, um, or prefers having six electrons close to it. Right now it has one, two, three, four, five electrons close to it. And so it doesn't have enough electrons close to it because it would prefer to not be sharing electrons with this hydrogen. It wants both those hydrogens for itself. So our last step is either some base or in some mechanisms, they will use iodine as the base, iodide as the base. I prefer to think of it as like either the solvent is doing it or another molecule of the nucleophile is doing it. Because as we know, iodine, iodide um, is that a weak base, a strong base, or not basic at all? Very weak base. In fact, it's so weak, as we know, hydrogen and iodide, is that a strong or a weak acid, HI? That's a strong acid. So do hydrogen and iodide ever get back together? Or are they like through? Do they ever get back together, hydrogen and iodide? Oh, Oh, it's a one-way arrow. They do not get back together. So even though some mechanisms will show that iodide or whatever the leaving group was, which is often a halogen, will act as the base to deprotonate in this step, I don't like that as I just told you why. But in any case, we don't really care about that here. But just to show in our mechanism, we do have to deprotonate. And so this is why often um, an SN1 reaction will take three steps. Uh, a lot of texts will show uh, only two steps or will tell you that it's a two-step reaction. But in reality, a lot of our reagents, a lot of our nucleophiles in SN1 are protic. They have, um, they have an additional hydrogen on the nucleophilic atom, which will require deprotonation in the last step. And what functional group have we made? What functional group have we made? A ketone? We do have a carbonyl. An ester, yes. So we have a carbonyl with an O that has an R group. We do have an ester. So this is probably not an SN1 reaction that we've seen before. Um, often we'll use things like alcohol uh, or water to do SN1 reactions. Um, so the reason why I included acetic acid, a carboxylic acid as the nucleophile is because the MCAT likes to show you things you haven't seen before. And we'll finish this up, well, this example up, and then we'll delve a little bit more into like the mechanics of how SN2 and SN1 reactions occur. But right now we're gonna do just briefly the rate laws. So in this case, we have a one-step mechanism. And remember rate laws, who goes into a rate law? The reactants that participate in which step of a reaction? The rate determining step. And if you were to describe, yes, if you were to describe the rate determining step to a, to a um, uh, what's it called again? When somebody's um, not part of your field, uh, layman, to a layman, you would say, oh, the slow step, exactly. So, um, in SN2, our rate law will be equal to K times nucleophile concentration, which was Cn minus, and then times electrophile concentration, which was our alkyl halide. So let's say that a problem asked you if we were to triple 
the concentration of cyanide and we were to have the concentration of ethyl iodide, what would happen to the rate of the reaction? Triple R cyanide concentration and have our ethyl iodide concentration. Overall, how will our rate change? What factor will our rate change by? Increase by 1.5 times, excellent. We could say three halves or 1.5 times. So any questions on how to approach um, a question where they ask you about say an SN2 reaction and how does changing concentrations of reactants affect rate? Any questions here? And then our rate law, we don't have a lot of space here, our rate law for our SN1 reaction. So as we said, oh yeah, can you, can I go over which part? Oh, how to, how to approach that kind of question, yeah. Um, so first, so the, the question would say something along the lines of, um, given the following reaction, and they won't tell you if it's an SN1 or an SN2 in most cases, given the following reaction, so you'd start by defining, do we have an SN1 or an SN2 or some other kind of reaction? Um, but for rate laws, it's, it's always SN1 and SN2, I'll tell you that, um, unless they've done some passage where they had you get a rate law for a different thing or gave you a rate law for something else. So then they would tell you, oh, the, this concentration of this reactant changed by this factor and this concentration of this reactant changed by this other factor. So they would have said something like, what would happen, what happened to the rate of the reaction if you were to triple the concentration of cyanide and have the concentration of ethyl iodide? Um, and then the options would be something like, oh, the rate would triple, the rate would decrease by a factor of two, um, the rate would increase by a factor of two thirds, the rate would increase by a factor of three halves. And then of course, your job is to factor into this rate law Okay, well, if my CN is a nucleophile, I know the nucleophile is in the rate law. So I got to triple it. But then if my ethyl iodide is being halved, then I need to have that. And so we would times three divided by two and we'd get the rate changing by a factor of three halves. All right, any other questions? So then rate law for our SN1. So in the SN2 case, awesome. In the SN2 case, uh, as we said, there's only one step and that step is the slow step. In SN1, there's multiple steps and the leaving group leaving to form a carbocation is always the rate determining step. So we could say that our rate law for an SN1 reaction is equal to K times concentration of the electrophile. And so let's say that they had a question for you where they tripled the acetic acid concentration and they halved the, um, what is that, isopropyl iodide concentration. How would that affect the rate? Decrease by one half, excellent. Decrease by a factor of a half. Because in this case, our acetic acid concentration doesn't matter because nobody's waiting around for acetic acid to attack. We're all waiting around for iodine to leave. And so iodine, the alkyl iodide is the only one that affects the rate and it'll decrease by a half if you divide the concentration by two. Any questions on that one? All right, I'm going to erase. Let's talk a little bit more about the mechanics of our substitution reactions. And so we'll go back to SN2. So 
So SN2 reactions, the goal is to have them happen really fast. So SN2 reactions are going to use conditions that enhance rate. As we saw in our mechanism, the nucleophilic attack and the leaving group leaving occur simultaneously. And in terms of nucleophile strength, we said we want a strong nucleophile. In terms of leaving group carbon substitution, we have methyl primary, secondary, and tertiary. And which degree of substitution will happen the fastest and in what order? Methyl fastest, followed by, of course, primary, nice, secondary, and then we'll give like two carrots for tertiary. In practice, you would very, you would see very little um, SN2 like reaction with a tertiary carbon um, to leaving group. And on the MCAT, you will not see that happen ever at all. And the reason for this leaving group carbon substitution order, we would say is that the main kinetic barrier in this reaction is steric hindrance. So steric hindrance is always a kinetic property. And in the case of an SN2 reaction, the main consideration to make in terms of kinetic is steric hindrance. Uh, all right, so any questions here? So I find SN2 to be a convenient place to introduce transition states. So let's start with this guy and we'll be reacting with Br minus. So first let's define the degree of substitution of our leaving group. First of all, who is our leaving group? Is it the methyl ethyl hydrogen or the weird looking sulfur thing? Sulfur thing. So, is this a good leaving group or a poor leaving group? Good, how do we know? It looks like it has a lot of potential for because of the charge of a pH. And what is the, yeah, stabilize. What is the, um, what does the pH mean? When, do you, when you see something written as a pH, a phenyl, right, a benzene ring, perfect. Um, yeah, so, we know that when leaving groups leave, what charge do they uh, do they have when they leave? Positive, negative, neutral. Leaving groups when they leave usually have a negative charge, and so we know we're going to get a negative charge on this guy when it leaves. But we have a lot of pi bonds that we can use to stabilize this leaving group once it leaves. So this is a fantastic leaving group.
because it is resonance stabilized. And Br minus, is that a good or a poor nucleophile? Br minus is a great nucleophile. And what's the degree of substitution of our carbon that our leaving groups attach to? Primary, secondary, tertiary? Degree of substitution here. Secondary, yes. So we don't count hydrogen, we count, we don't count our leaving group either. We do count any carbons attached to the carbon our leaving groups on, which is methyl and ethyl. So we do have a secondary uh, carbon to leaving group. And this is an option for SN2 reactions. When this BR attacks, is it gonna attack from the same side as the leaving group or the back side? SN2, one of the features is the nucleophile always attacks from the backside. Now, the reason for this just seems rather intuitive, right? We can't attack from the same side as the leaving group because that's where the leaving group is. And so there's no room for the nucleophile. And that's sort of true, uh, but the reasons go a little bit beyond that. Within the scope of the MCAT, um, we don't really talk about anti-bonding orbitals. But I will tell you what's happening here is for every bonding orbital. So we have carbon is making an, a bond with a bonding orbital to oxygen. here. With every bonding orbital, there's a secret anti-bonding orbital 180 degrees from, uh, from it in three-dimensional space. So there's an anti-bonding orbital behind this carbon from which or, uh, and, and the problem with BR attacking at the same time that oxygen is, is leaving is that carbon cannot exceed its octet and its bonding orbital is already occupied. So what will happen is BR will use its electrons to make a bond with carbon using its anti-bonding orbital while carbon breaks its bond with oxygen. And the anti-bonding orbital when BR is putting its electrons in there becomes a bonding orbital. That's the, the actual background on why backside attacks happen. You may have learned this in your undergrad organic chemistry class, and then it never came up again, probably. That's what happened to me. Now, if we were to look at what's, what is happening here in an imaginary microscope, because you actually can't see a uh, transition state in a microscope, can't observe them. They're only around for a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second or whatever, however you say that. So in our transition state, so like what is a transition state? Where do we see it on one of these guys? The beginning, the end, the top, the top of the curve. The transition state, is how we define what type of energy between reactants and transition state. Energy of activation, perfect. And what is a transition state? A transition state is a temporary, highly unstable, A temporary, highly unstable um, structure of partially broken and formed bonds. Because in every chemical reaction, we know some bonds are broken and some bonds are formed. And so the transition state is like halfway through the forming and the breaking of those bonds. So a common way to draw the bonds in question is using dotted lines. We would have our bromine here. We would have our O, SO2, pH here, and our methyl and our ethyl down here. And so, of course, we know carbon cannot make five bonds, which is why this is only around for a split second. And this will be known 
as a pentavalent transition state. Pentavalent referring to the number of substituents on the carbon, pentavalent transition state. After which our bromine will finish making its bond with carbon and our leaving group will finish doing its job of leaving. And we will end up with this guy as our product. And this guy, which has a lot of trend, uh, into a large resonance structure as well. A lot of resonance structures. Um, any questions on the like sort of transition state aspect of this or anything else so far? The molecule configuration also changes after the leaving group leaves. Nice, so you're already on to my next question, which is, did the stereochemistry, was it retained or did it invert? Uh, for SN1 attack is from any angle, yes. Um, I guess it, it attacks from whatever, uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. For SN1, the carbocation ha is associated with an empty P orbital. And so in SN1, the nucleophile will come in here. It won't do like a backside attack. It'll just attack from wherever the carbons are away from, which is the empty P orbital. Nice. Yep, so our stereochemistry inverted. Any other questions on this example? All right, a few more characteristics of SN2 before we move on. Um, we talked about antibody orbital, stereochemistry inverting. Um, I go to erase. Uh, would all these steps be required to answer one question on uh, the MCAT uh, or multiple questions? Um, they could ask you about a lot of different aspects of these reactions. So you probably wouldn't have to do, I mean, you could, you could definitely get a problem. You have to predict like the, um, the product in this case. I don't know if I see them like asking you, what is the proper transition state? But they could show you a passage where they'd show you the transition state like this, which is why it's good to have been exposed to it. Um, they probably wouldn't ask about antibonding orbitals. I don't think that's something the MCAT is really concerned with. I think it's a little too high level for the MCAT and a little out of scope. Um, it's good to know in general, like what transition states are. Um, those are kind of the, and then they could ask you like, um, why is this a good leaving group or something like that? So yeah, definitely individual aspects of this problem would be potential questions, um, but yeah, probably not all at once. Yeah. Other questions? All right. So we'll just talk briefly about solvent for SN2. So SN2 solvents. So sometimes you may uh, find that there's a solvent that tells you basically that you're doing an SN2 reaction. So maybe they're describing some experimental procedure that was done in the lab. And maybe they, you know, um, they, they give you, uh, they don't tell you that you're doing an SN2 reaction directly, but you see an SN2 solvent in the procedure. And you're at that point, you're a step ahead of people who aren't familiar with SN2 solvents. Although most people will be familiar for the MCAT. I know there's, I know it's on Occupart and stuff like that. So for SN2 solvents, we want polar or non-polar? And do we want protic or aprotic? Polar, non-polar, protic, aprotic. So we will use a polar solvent. And in this case, a protic. So what does a protic mean? Proton does not have any hydrogens. Or is it something else?
without protons. See, that's what it sounds like. So they could have probably chosen a better, more intuitive name. What they mean by aprotic is something that is non-hydrogen bonding. So protic solvents are hydrogen bonding, such as water or an alcohol or a carboxylic acid, or I guess an amine could be a protic solvent. Um, so aprotic, meaning non-hydrogen bonding. So let's think about why that would be a case. So let's say we had a nucleophile like Br minus. And we were in a protic solvent. Because what is a protic solvent? Or sorry, yeah. Um, when we say a protic solvent, something that hydrogen bonds, what type of intermolecular force is hydrogen bonding? What type of intermolecular force is hydrogen bonding? It's a subset or a subcategory of dipole-dipole, yes. Um, so even though, so, so hydrogen bonding really is just a very strong dipole-dipole force. So uh, for the MCAT, we've memorized what are the elements that hydrogen bond. We've memorized the three R, NOF, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. In reality, hydrogen bonding exists on a spectrum. So something like bromine can form a very weak hydrogen bond You can have hydrogen bonding between things like bromine uh, and a hydrogen, like a, like a water or something like that, or chlorine or sulfur as well. Um, so hydrogen bonding really exists on a spectrum and we just memorize that hydrogen bonding is strongest with NOF. We eliminate all the nuance by saying that's those are the only ones that can hydrogen bond. But in reality, we can form a, like a, a weak hydrogen bond note, uh, weaker H bond, than NOF, because of course, those guys are even more electronegative. So they form a much stronger hydrogen bond. Is the hydrogen bond serving to stabilize or destabilize the BR? Stabilizes it, yeah. All intramolecular forces are stabilizing forces. So if we are stabilizing, where do I want to write this? If we are stabilizing our nucleophile, is it becoming more or less reactive? Yes, it's becoming less reactive. We know stability and reactivity are inverse. Is that good for an SN2 reaction? Do we want a non-reactive nucleophile? Is that good or bad? That's bad. We want, we want this to be as reactive as possible. So therefore we're not gonna use hydrogen bonding solvents because they're gonna do far too good of a job at stabilizing our highly reactive nucleophile. So any questions on why we don't want a protic solvent? So some examples of aprotic solvents. I'll show you some of the most common ones. DMF, which is dimethylformamide. Uh, that's a hydrogen. And a carbon. So DMF, so we have dimethyl form refers to a one carbon, carbon carboxylic acid derivative and an amide, dimethylformamide. That's one example of an SN2 solvent. That's kind of the most common THF, which is tetrahydrofuran, think furanose sugars and stuff. Uh, acetone. is another common one, diethyl ether. And esters in general. So those are our SN2 solvents that we're going to most commonly see. Any questions here?
Good, good. All right. So I'm going to erase, and then we will tackle a SN1, a little bit of a more difficult mechanism than the one we've seen already. So with SN1 reactions, we know that the leaving group leaves prior to the nucleophilic attack. We'll use an example. We'll use this as our example molecule. And we will react it with methanol. All right, so do we have a strong or a weak nucleophile with methanol? Strong or a weak nucleophile with methanol? I don't see any formal charges, so looks pretty weak, right? Do I have a good or a bad uh, a leaving group? Do I have a good or a poor leaving group? Yeah, not a great leaving group. Alcohols, poor leaving groups. What is the strategy when you have a poor leaving group? What extra reagent do we include? Acid, excellent. So our first step, of course, will be to protonate our leaving group and turn it into a good leaving group. I don't want to do this. I'm just going to start going over here. Boom, boom, boom. Now, do we have a good or a bad leaving group? The great leaving group, much better. That's a water. Water is going to be perfectly happy to leave. And it will. So then the next step, the rate determining step, formation of our carbocation. And what degree of, of uh, degree of substitution is our carbocation? Primary, secondary, tertiary. We have a secondary carbocation. Is that the best carbocation we could make in this molecule? Could we make a better carbocation? It's not the best, we could make a better one. Yeah, a more substituted carbocation is one possible. And there is, if we can have a shift. So what is this, uh, what is this right here, this D? What is that D there? Deuterium, yes. Uh, yeah, that's spelled right, deuterium. Um, and so deuterium is what? Is a hydrogen with one extra neutron, yes. So we have a deuterium and spoiler alert, whenever you see a deuterium in a molecule um, or for that matter, any mention of radio labeling, you are very likely to be getting a mechanism question. The thing about a normal hydrogen is we don't have to show them, right? We can, in bond line structure, we can, we can just ignore normal hydrogens. Uh, but deuteriums, because they're not a normal hydrogen are always shown. And so that's like, a, that's like a dead giveaway almost that they're gonna be asking you about a mechanism. So what will happen is we will have a deuteride shift. Uh, more commonly, you might hear hydride shift to form a better carbocation. So this is something to be on the lookout for with SN1 reactions, or for that matter, E1 reactions as well. When there is a carbocation present, rearrangements will always happen if you could form a more stable carbocation. 
which is now right here. And our deuterium is now right here. That looks like an O. Any questions so far? So we formed our tertiary carbocation. And now we are ready for methanol to attack. By the way, is there any sign of that original stereochemistry that we had? Sorry, just to make sure, is deuterium acting or not acting as a nucleophile? Um, in this case, what's happening is it, it sort of acts as like a leaving group first and it leaves with its electrons and then it sort of acts as a nucleophile. Yeah, you could think of it like that. Mm -hmm. So now we're ready for our nucleophilic attack to happen. And notice that when deuterium replaced the carbocation, it no longer has stereochemistry. It is now racemic. And that's because with a carbocation, you can attack from either side. There's no favoring one side or another side. Carbocations are sp2, 120 degree bonding angles. And our oxygen, of course, will have a plus because it's making three bonds. And some base, probably just a Probably just another methanol. Let me redraw that. That looks not great. Probably just another methanol or the water that left earlier. But there's, since methanol is the solvent here, it's more likely to be methanol. We'll deprotonate. And what functional group have we made? What functional group have we made? Over here. An ether. Yep. We have an oxygen that has a carbon on ether side. So any questions on the mechanism we just looked at? In this case, we had a one, two, three, four, five step mechanism. So definitely two or more steps are possible with SN1. So yeah, just in general, be on the lookout for whenever there's a carbocation. Um, my, old, uh, my old organic pro chemistry professor was a really big fan of the movie Fight Club. Um, in the movie Fight Club, um, uh, Brad, Brad Pitt's character, and I forget who the, uh, the other actor is, always uh, Edward Norton. Um, oh, I don't wanna spoil Fight Club. <laughs> I'm so anti-spoiler. Um, basically, um, he thinks he's getting in a fight with somebody, but he's actually hitting himself in the face. Let's just say that. So is it easier for somebody to come up and hit me in the face, or is it easier, faster for me to hit myself in the face? It's easier for me to hit myself in the face. Um, so likewise, well, yourself, <laughs> yes, you're right. Um, so likewise, if it's, it's gonna be faster to have a, an intramolecular reaction happen, which is called a rearrangement. Rearrangement. It's faster for the rearrangement to happen than for the nucleophile to come attack. That's the point of that metaphor. All right, any questions before we finish up uh, SN1? So um, other characteristics for SN1, um, I 
with our nucleophile strength. So because the leaving group leaves prior to the nucleophilic attack, we'd use a weaker nucleophile. Because we're not in any hurry with our nucleophile. Our rate determining step is a leaving group leaving. Our leaving group to carbon substitution What will be the order of reactivity? Three, two, one, perfect. So tertiary will be the best followed by secondary and primary and methyl just are not really gonna happen at all. And what is the main kinetic barrier to an SN1 reaction? We said for an SN2 reaction, the main kinetic barrier was steric hindrance. In this case, the main kinetic barrier is carbocation CCAT formation. So our degree of reactivity for SN1 electrophiles follows the degree of stability for carbocations. Another way that, um, actually, let's say uh, rearrangements, carbocation rearrangements are possible. Solvent choice. In this case, we do use a polar protic solvent, meaning it is hydrogen bonding. And let's think about why that would be the case. Well, if our major kinetic barrier is carbocation formation, Let's say that I think about how a carbocation would respond to a protic solvent. So a protic solvent, which is, as we said earlier, is a very highly polar solvent, is going to be able to use electrons from the oxygen to help stabilize the carbocation. Protic oxygen stabilizes carbocation. So in this case, it's good to have stability. So we're not stabilizing our nucleophile. We don't really care about our nucleophile strength. So we know we're gonna have a super strong electrophile. However, we do need to actually form that electrophile. So we need to be able to somewhat stabilize it. And so that would be the role of a protic solvent. What else? What are some examples of protic solvents? Water and alcohols would be your most common. Um, any other questions here before we move on? All right, and one thing that is good to bring up here, this is a, a ripe place to talk about, would be, um, so we said protonation, this isn't even under SN1 to be honest actually. We could do, if we had a strong nucleophile, we could do an SN2 reaction. So protonation enhances 
leaving group ability. Coordination enhances leading leaving group ability. And if that makes sense, if we think about it, because if you're a leaving group, you are typically more or less electronegative than the carbon you're leaving from. In your leaving group, you're typically more or less electronegative than the carbon you're leaving from. More, right? Think about leaving groups, chlorine, oxygen. Um, well, in this case, oxygen, um, bromine, iodine, uh, the OSO2 pH that we saw before. So when that bond gets broken between you and the carbon you're leaving from, since you are more electronegative, you're gonna take the electrons with you. So when in the breakup, the more electronegative one always gets the electrons. So the problem is if you're a neutral leaving group before leaving, you're gonna be negative once you've left. So the benefit of protonation is we give you extra positive charge before you leave so that when you leave, you're actually neutral. Let me know if that makes sense. Did I repeat that? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, because when you are acting as a leaving group, leaving groups are more electronegative than carbon. So, when you act as a leaving group, leaving groups take the electrons in the bond when they leave. Therefore, we end up with a leaving group minus afterwards. So protonation, if we give you extra positive charge, by uh, giving you an extra bond before you leave, then you're more stable when you leave. And you would be, instead of LG minus, you would be H dash LG after. Does that make sense? Anything I can clarify? Okay, cool, cool. Another way to, oh, so leaving group has more negative. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so leaving group being more electronegative once it leaves, therefore, it'll take the electrons. The carbon will not get to take, keep the electrons because carbon is not electronegative enough to keep the electrons from the bond that is broken when the leaving group leaves. So by giving the leaving group positive charge, we can make it more comfortable once it's left. So instead of leaving as an OH minus, it's gonna leave in this case as a water. Nice, cool, cool. And so let's also talk about one more way to enhance leaving group ability. Tossillation. So this isn't something that you would ex you'd be expected to have extensive background on for an MCAT question, but this is something that they could include in a passage. So like some other things that are like not in scope technically, I like to go over them just so that you have that extra sort of like step ahead um, once you've gotten to that problem or passage. So tossillation. So toss, let's see, we use the same example. So toss is a structure that looks like or actually I'll draw it with the chlorine. So it's a uh, sulfonic derivative, a sulfonyl derivative rather, has a benzene, technically it's a methyl, methyl benzene. So TOS stands for toluene sulfonic acid. And so if we replace the OH 
So this would be this would be toluene sulfonic acid. It's an organic version of sulfuric acid, right? If we replace, we turn it into like an acid chloride, basically. We haven't gone over together these carboxylic acid derivatives, but we're basically turning a carboxylic acid into an acid chloride. And so this is a great leaving group, the Cl. What can happen is the OH or the O can attack. The details of the mechanism are beyond what we're currently capable of, but uh, it looks something like that. And remember that so this isn't this isn't an SN2 reaction that's happening here, and it's also not happening at this carbon. So this would actually preserve the stereochemistry at the carbon itself because it's the oxygen who's doing the attack. Um, and now what we've made is an OTOS, and this is an exceptional leaving group. Very good leaving group. Um, actually, we kind of saw a very similar example in our SN2 problem. So any questions on tosylation? That's another way to enhance leaving group ability by giving the leaving group lots of opportunities for resonance. Questions before we move on? All right. So a couple practice problems before we talk about E1 and E2. And I promise we won't go as extensively into E1 and E2 because technically they're not even on the list of reactions for the MCAT, but they actually are. <laughs> because spoiler alert, E1 and E2 are uh, the same thing as like dehydration reactions. A couple practice problems to check our ability on SN1 and SN2. So the question here will be, identify the product or, or you know, figure out what the product is and then classify each of these as SN1 or SN2. Probably help if you can see the whole problem. So I'll give you a moment. All right. So for starters, um, NASH, what is going to be the nucleophile in our first problem here? What is the nucleophilic atom? Sulfur. Yes. So we have a SH minus. Remember, sulfur is in the same group as oxygen. So this is basically the sulfur version of hydroxide. And because sulfur is a larger atom, if we remember from OCHEM Toolkit Part 1, I want to say, um, larger nucleophiles are better nucleophiles. So this is a nucleophile that's actually even better than hydroxide. And so will this be an SN1 or an SN2 reaction? SN2 reaction for sure. Because do we have a good or a poor leaving group? Excellent leaving group, great leaving group. And we have a secondary carbon connected to the leaving group. So I intentionally left the degree of substitution as not a factor that you could consider because secondary can do both. And I also intentionally did not include a solvent. So we would have to just use our knowledge of nucleophilicity 
and this would be an SN2 reaction. And what would happen to our stereochem? Inverted. So we would have a thiol on a wedge. Questions on our first practice problem? All right, so for starters, in our second one here, who's going to be the nucleophile? What is gonna be the nucleophilic atom? Um, somebody DM'd me and asked, "Good uh, is a good nucleophile always SN2? Um, for the most part, yes. But if you had a, well, for the purpose of the NCAT, let's say yes, because they're not gonna do some weird thing where they give you a good nucleophile, but they give you like a tertiary leaving group and you have to somehow balance those. So for our purposes, a good nucleophile will always um, support SN2. Cl is the leaving group, nitrogen is the nucleophile. Would that be the nitrogen from the amine or the amide? The amide, uh, nope, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, the problem with the nitrogen and the amide is it's actually part of a conjugated system with the carbonyl. And so because this nitrogen is part of that conjugated system, that lone pair on that nitrogen doesn't really belong to the nitrogen. It's sharing it with the whole conjugated system. So this is gonna be a poor nucleophile and this is gonna be a decent nucleophile, which means that the bottom molecule must be not the nucleophile in this reaction, but the what? This bottom structure must be the Well, probably the probably this is the electrophile solvent. Yes, is this a polar or sorry, is this a protic or an aprotic solvent? Protic. It's got a nitrogen with a hydrogen. We can we know that that is a protic solvent. And so, of course, the chlorine is going to have to leave first. The nitrogen is going to make a bond. And are we going to have stereochemistry? Retained, inverted, or racemized? Racemized, perfect. This would be our final product. Any questions on our practice problems? When you say stereochemistry, you're referring to structure, just referring to structure. Uh huh. Yeah, so like specifically on this carbon, because we know that in the carbocation, stereochemistry is always lost. Since the carbocation will be sp2 120 degrees. Did I answer your question, Michael? Oh, sorry, no names. <laughs> awesome. Okay, cool, cool. Um, lastly, let's talk about E1 and E2. And as promised, we go in a little bit less detail. Okay, so um, for E2, so for elimination in general, actually, we'll start with elimination in general. Elimination reactions will have, instead of a nucleophile, a base, the base will deprotonate the carbon adjacent to the leaving group. The base will deprotonate a carbon adjacent to the leaving group, uh, leaving group's carbon, let's say. Um, and it will form a double bond. So instead of a nucleophile, we use a base. And instead of uh, forming a, like a new sigma bond, which we do in substitution, we form a pi bond. 
let's see, what other things to talk about here? Make a note to remember to do SN versus E and then base versus nucleophile. Is there a shortcut to know if the process is SN1 or SN2? Oh, there's a lot of shortcuts to know. Um, so with SN2 reactions, we're always looking for, for starters, an aprotic solve. It would be a dead giveaway that we're doing SN2. We look at the nucleophile strength. If it's strong, that would favor SN2. And then if the leaving group is primary um, substituted, then that would be another good giveaway that it's an SN2 reaction. And usually you're only going to need to weigh one of those factors. They're not going to have you weigh some factors favor SN2 and other factors favor SN1. Um, because how are you supposed to weight which factors count more than other factors? So that's how you would know for SN2. For SN1, it's always a dead giveaway if you're using a protic solvent. So now a water solvent or an alcohol solvent. Um, you would have a weaker nucleophile. You have a more substituted leaving group. Um, that's how you would know whether to consider doing an SN2 or an SN1 on a given reaction. If you were given the reaction, but not, and like the reactant in the product, and you needed to decide, did an SN1 or an SN2 reaction happen here? What would you be primarily looking at? You're given a reactant and a product, and you had to determine whether an SN1 or an SN2 reaction happened. What would be your primary clue that you'd be looking at? Let's assume you weren't given reactants or a salt, uh, reagents or a salt. Stereochemistry, exactly. So if you had an inversion of stereochemistry, you would know without even knowing what the reagents were that it was, yeah, exactly, that it was an SN2. If you had a racemization of stereochemistry, you would know without them having told you that it's an SN1 reaction. Okay, so let's look at a couple examples. So how do I want to do this? I put a methyl here, I put a methyl here, and I put a chloride here. And we will use a strong hydroxide base. So if I'm using a strong base, um, based on our knowledge of SN1 and SN2, am I probably doing an E1 or an E2 reaction? With a strong base, probably E1 or E2. Probably E2, right? Um, since we compared strong nucleophiles with SN2. So there's, uh, I hate, like, I almost hate to introduce some of this to you. <laughs> Sorry to say that, because like, I don't wanna go overboard with nuance, like some, uh, some websites will when they talk about these things, but I also don't wanna leave you high and dry in case there was a rule of nuance you were supposed to know. Uh, with E2 reactions, one rule, and this, so this will be an E2 reaction. I should draw that E2 somewhere else. With E2 reactions, one rule is the H that gets uh, deprotonated must be anti to the leaving group. The H that gets deprotonated must be anti to the leaving group. So very similarly to the anti bonding thing we talked about with backside attacks in SN2. With E2, because all, everything's happening at once, we're doing, so this hydrogen is anti, this hydrogen is sin, they're both on wedges, so this is anti. So these will be the steps that will happen. We'll deprotonate the hydrogen on the carbon adjacent to the leaving group, and the leaving group will leave in the same react in, reaction step. We will form one product only. We'll have the electrons from the carbon to hydrogen bond. We're forming a pi bond here. This guy will be untouched. Cl was the leaving group. For the methyl here, 
Does it still have stereochemistry? Is this methyl here gonna still be on a wedge? We have a wedge or a dash on a pi bond. Yep. Pi bonds are always sp2, 120. So we'll have loss of stereochem on pi bond. That's getting really small in the corner over there. Loss of stereochemistry on the pi bond. Um, so the reason why we need a hydrogen that's anti to the leaving group, and again, this is something that I, I don't think you should, like, should keep you up at night by any means, but it's something that I would like to show you just in case. Um, is similar to the antibonding orbital and the backside attack in SN2, we can't attack a place that's already occupied. We have to go to the back. We use the antibonding orbital so we don't overwhelm uh, the carbon by giving it too many electrons at once. So likewise, with E2, this carbon that we're making have a pi bond already has a full octet of electrons. And so it's the whole antibonding orbital thing again. The so bonding orbital is on the wedge, the antibonding orbital is on the dash. And so we can put our pi bond in the antibonding orbital on the dash of this. And therefore the hydrogen that's being used to make the pi bond must also be going the same direction as the antibonding orbital. So it must be opposite to the lead. Does that make sense? Any questions? Maybe I can clarify. So that's just a rule to, I don't know if you would want to put that on a hockey card or not. Um, now then with everybody ready for me to proceed to E1, and then we'll do these two bullet points and we will finish up for the day. It doesn't look like any questions. So we're going to use the same molecule. Uh, Is the same molecule for E1. We'll use a weak base such as water. No, we we'll use methanol. Let's, let's be bad. <laughs> let's, let's change it up. Use methanol. Actually, it doesn't matter what the base is um, because uh, we're not going to have a different structure in our final product. We'll just have the original structure with a new pi bond with formed. So what's gonna happen first in E1, we have a weak base. So we have to wait for the leaving group to leave. The leaving group will leave forming a carbocation. And now because the carbocation is sp2, 120, planar, we don't have to worry about the orientation of the hydrogen. So we could have really either of these occur. And based on the structure I gave you, there would be no preference for either one. And so we would get both of these products could form. So any questions on E1? Good to go. All right, our last two bullet points for the day. And you don't need to know things like what, uh, what solvent is best for E1 versus E2. Of course, they actually both use typically a protic solvent. You may see some sources that say E2 as an aprotic solvent, but like, I don't know when you would decide between aprotic or protic solvent, and you won't have to for the MCAT. Um, we're not going to go as detail on elimination because it's not technically in the list of reactions, even though elimination, of course, is part of the aldol condensation. It's part of a lot of reactions. We have a lot of reactions metabolism that have elimination reactions happen. We usually call them dehydration reactions. Um, but yeah. 
Now, if you've watched my metabolism videos, you've already heard me talk about dehydration elimination kind of interchangeably. So um, let's define addition elimination and substitution in terms of bonding. So with, we haven't gotten to addition yet. With elimination, we said we break a bond to the leaving group. Uh, we have, we lose a sigma bond to the leaving group. We gain a pi bond, which is the alkene. With substitution, we lose a sigma bond also to the leaving group. What kind of bond do we gain in substitution? Is it sigma or pi? Sigma. We gain a sigma bond to the nucleophile. And then in addition, which we haven't got to yet, gotten to yet, we will gain a sigma bond. Or I guess we're doing loss and gain. We'll lose a pi bond, which is typically a carbonyl. And we will gain a sigma bond, which is to the nucleophile. So make sure that these definitions are 100,000% crystal clear. And please feel free to ask me any questions to clarify. You wanna be super duper duper clear on all these three definitions because they'll not only be important for, um, if you get a question of, was this an addition reaction? Was this an elimination reaction? Was this a substitution reaction? But it's gonna help us to synthesize everything back together once we've covered in our next lecture, addition reactions. And in our final lecture of reactions in organic chemistry, we'll be covering carboxylic acid derivatives, which do addition and elimination reactions all at once. So that's why it's super clear, super important to be clear on this. So any questions? I just had a question. Need a second to type it out though. Feel free. Yes. Uh, why is a CL, why is CL a good leaving group for E1? Um, in general, CL is a good leaving group. How, uh, CL, BR, and I are all fairly large. So halogens, CL minus, BR minus, I minus, they're fairly large. Iodine's the largest. They're also fairly electronegative. Chlorine is the most electronegative. Um, so their size and their electronegativity make them great leaving groups. If you're a large atom, especially like iodine, you really do not care that you have a negative charge. What's one more electron when you have 100 already? Um, for something like Cl, maybe you don't have as, you're not as large as iodine, so it's not the size as much. You're still pretty large, um, but it's but you also as a Cl minus, um, you're fairly electronegative. The exception is fluoride. F minus fluoride is not a good leaving group because it's just too small. Even though it's highly electronegative, it's very, very small. So not only is it hard to break a bond to fluorine because it's such a short bond, um, uh, F minus is also bad at stabilizing a negative charge because it doesn't have a lot of room like iodine or bromine to like, and even chlorine to delocalize electrons and stabilize a ne negative charge. So hopefully I answered your question there. Wanted to confirm a pi bond is a double bond and a sigma bond is just a single bond. Um, so in a, so all sigma, all single bonds are sigma. Um, so if we have just a single bond is sigma and then multiple bonds will consist of one sigma and one pi or double bonds and multiple bonds that are triple will have one sigma and two pi. So every, every bond, single, double, triple always has at least one sigma bond. Um, and then if you have more than one bond, so double or triple, you will also additionally have a um, pi bond or two pi bonds. So additional bonding is always, is always pi. But other questions? Am I good to erase this? 
Uh, got you. All right, lastly. So we said that substitution uses nucleophiles and elimination uses bases. Is there any overlap between the definitions of nucleophiles and bases? Can a nucleophile also sometimes be a base or vice versa? And the answer is for sure. There's a lot of overlap between nucleophiles and bases. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to have, on the top, we'll have nucleophile, no, on the X, on the Y axis, we're gonna have nucleophile strength. We'll have strong nucleophile versus weak nucleophile. And then on the X axis, we'll have base strength. So we'll have strong base and weak base. And so for example, something that's a strong nucleophile and a strong base is hydroxide, as well as alkoxides. So we have our OH minus, we have our OR minuses. Um, something that is a strong nucleophile, but a weak base would be thiols. So the SH minus that we saw before is a strong nucleophile, but a weak base. Another example is cyanide is a strong nucleophile, but a weak base. And then in the weak and weak sort of quadrant, we have water, alcohols, um, and in the weak nucleophile strong base, can anybody think of a weak nucleophile that is a strong base? Uh, F, Florian? Is a weak nucleophile but a strong base? Um, it is a, it's a, it is actually a fairly weak base as well. Um, so something that's a, that is a strong base, but a weak nucleophile might have like a formal charge, but be very sterically hindered. So terpetoxide is one example. Yeah, nice. Oh, I didn't see that. Perfect. Terpetoxide, great. As well as LDA. Uh, and these are in no particular order. And then what else do I want to include here? I think that's most of them. Um, I want to include carboxylates and, uh, and enolates. So I'm gonna kind of put like carboxylate here and enolate here. So carboxylates, no, that's wrong. Enolate here, carboxylate here. Let me make those a little bigger. I'm just gonna write it. Um, carboxylate and enolate. So carboxylates are weaker bases and weaker nucleophiles than enolates, which are stronger bases and stronger nucleophiles. They're still not really up in the top um, or the bottom of both of those sort of directions. So if you're a strong base and a strong nucleophile, would you do SN1, SN2, E1, E2, which of the above? And it could be more than one. Would you do SN1 or SN2 if you're in the top quadrant? SN2 for sure because you're a strong nucleophile. Would you do E1 or E2? E2, because you're a strong base. If you are weak in both categories, SN1 and E1, and then if you're a weak base, but a strong nucleophile, you'd be more likely to do Weak base, but a strong nucleophile.
probably mostly SN2. And if you are a strong base, but a weak nucleophile, you're mostly gonna do E2. So here's sort of, let me see if I can get rid of my glare. If you want to perhaps take a picture. That's easy. Yeah, so here's our sort of like quad, our two by two quadrant for um, our like a decision tree if you were faced with having to do substitution and elimination potentially. Uh, yeah, any questions on our last uh, example here? Any other questions before I let everybody go for the day? Why don't we have a SN reaction for our Q3, quadrant three, and an E reaction in our Q2? Um, I will just tell you that like these guys, they're just too bulky to do substitution reactions. They just literally cannot do any substitution reaction at all. Oh, sorry, I didn't finish drawing LDA. You heard a sound, that was my cat knocking something over. <laughs> and then why don't we have an, e to, an elimination reaction here? Now, I think it's possible that these guys could do an E1, but I don't see it ever happening in like the MCAT. Uh, can you draw enolate and carboxylate? Yes. So enolate, Is going to look like this. So it's, an, it's a carbon adjacent to a carbonyl that has a negative charge. Of course, it has a resonance structure that looks like this. We'll talk a little bit more, I think, in, in lesson two of OCHEM reactions. And the resonance hybrid looks like this. And then carboxylate. looks like this, and of course has another resonance structure as well uh, that looks exactly the same pretty much. And so carboxylate will look like this. All right, any other questions while we're still recording for YouTube? Awesome, super glad to hear it. Well, everybody, um, for everybody in class today. Uh, we will, of course, have our next lecture on addition reactions. And for everybody on uh, watching this on YouTube, um, thanks for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you found it helpful. If you have any questions or if I did anything wrong, feel free to let me know in the comments and feel free to subscribe to my YouTube channel or like my video for more um, OCHEM content. And here's our mascot <laughs> right on time. All right, bye everybody.